All right, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in with us to our evening devotional and prayer time. Let's go ahead and have a quick word of prayer, and we'll jump right into the lesson, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for all you've given us, Lord. Thank you, God, for the many blessings of this life, Lord, even just looking outside, Lord, enjoying your beautiful creation, Lord, what you've done for us, what you've made uh, for yourself, and also for us to enjoy. Uh, God, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful services we had yesterday, Lord. Uh, Lord, what a blessing it was to hear your word, Lord, even take communion, Lord. I pray, God, that you continue to help our church to grow and be founded in your word, Lord. And uh, even this week, try to apply some of the principles that we learned this weekend, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to reach out and touch this world, Lord. I know that we are living in an imperfect world, but help us, Lord, not to just uh, endure, uh, uh, Lord, living here, but also... Do our part, Lord, to be the salt and the light uh, to this lost and dying world. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for those that may be struggling, uh, Lord, on beds of illness, Lord, uh, throughout the week. I pray, God, that you just touch them in a very special way. Lord, no doubt there's hundreds of requests that, Lord, need to be addressed. And, Lord, uh, thankfully, you are a very sovereign and all-knowing and omniscient God. I pray, God, that you just answer every prayer according to your will. I pray, God, that even now you would be with uh, our nation, our country, Lord, uh, Lord, our world. I pray, God, that we can see the revival that we need, beginning with ourselves and in our church, Lord, in our hometown, Lord, our home state, throughout our country, Lord, and and really globally. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to continue being that lighthouse in such a dark world. Uh, I pray, God, that you would uh, be with us even today, Lord, as we uh, take some time to study your word. I pray, God, that it can be a blessing to us and we can Find something to help sustain us spiritually throughout the day, uh, throughout this evening. And I pray, God, that can be uh, a blessing to the hearer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, we're going to start kind of a mini-series on the life of Joseph. I love doing character studies. I love uh, just examining their lives and really putting myself into their shoes and seeing what God can do through us. Um, and in us as Christians, uh, and what better person to start with than Joseph, right? Just amazing hero of the faith. Uh, even Brother Carl mentioned it Sunday morning. It's really hard to find a, a lot of black marks on their record between Daniel and Joseph and people like that. Just a, a great example for us Christians to follow. So we're going to jump right into Genesis 37. Verses 1 through 4, to go ahead and start. Uh, There's going to be a four or five different parts to this series. So today I just kind of want to give us kind of a macro view of the life of Joseph and hopefully set somewhat of a foundation to keep moving forward with the series. Uh, Genesis 37, verse number 1, says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So, as it goes with any hero, uh, even in general, I mean, all the movies that we have floating around today, uh, every hero has his origin, or has his beginning, and uh, just to put this in perspective, uh, we know people like uh, Spider-Man, I'm, I don't know a whole lot about these movies, but uh, he was bitten by like a spider, and that's how he got his power. Batman was a witness to his parents being murdered. Uh, so that drove him throughout his entire life of, you know, uh, killing bad guys and stuff like that. But I said that to say this. We can let those moments in our life uh, take us down one of two different roads. A road that's going to exalt God and exalt Christ and glorify Him, or a road that's really going to um, uh, do harm to His will. In our lives so thinking about our origin and, and what God has done in our lives what we've been through maybe some 
um, situations we've had to face. And no doubt, Joseph uh, started out with uh, kind of a tough origin. Um, we think of um, just some of the adversity that he had to face. And we think of Joseph having a father with four different wives, uh, with several different children from each one of these wives, and all of these children of which hated Joseph. So it says they couldn't even speak uh, peaceably unto him. We, we find that they were uh, very much, uh, had a lot of animosity toward him and just hate in their heart toward him. And so we see this dynamic adversity that Joseph experiences in his early life as 17 years old, having to deal with this kind of conflict, even at home. Uh, so it holds true with any hero, anyone that God has ever used in a great way. One of the defining factors of their life is adversity. So we're going to talk uh, today with our first lesson, uh, talk about dealing with adversity. Now, the word adversity means um, an opposing or unfavorable situation. Uh, so no doubt, we've even found ourselves in some situations like this that are um, not favorable, <laughs> right? If we had to get up in the morning and choose, uh, we would choose to not have a flat tire. We would choose to not face um, any kind of hardship or trial or failure. We actually spend a lot of our lives trying to avoid things like this. But what we don't know is that God wants to use these adversities and these difficult times in our life to kind of shape us and mold us to do His will. So we're going to find in the life of Joseph especially that um, he became a very uh, key and very important as far as playing the role of someone who literally saved Israel in a, in a very hard time. But we're going to see some of this adversity in his life that helped mold him to the man that God wanted him to be. Number one, he was loved, but loathed. So he was loved, but he was hated. Verse number three says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Uh, no doubt, we find since we were kids, we heard about the story of how he made him the coat of many colors. And I never looked too far into that as a child, but that was a pretty significant thing his father did for him. Uh, don't have any record of him making the same coat for his other children. Uh, this was a, uh, a symbol of his love towards Joseph and maybe even a symbol of position I've heard. And you, know, you can speculate a lot as to what exactly that meant to give him a gift like this. But no doubt it provoked in the hearts of the other brothers some jealousy, uh, some hatred toward Joseph. Uh, no doubt they spent plenty of time maybe mocking and uh, complaining and criticizing him. And we find here, if you actually do a study of the life of Joseph, it's, it's a very parallel symbol of the life of Christ. So um, very, very interesting here. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting to know that in John 1.11, you know, the Bible says that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. So there are certain places that we can go and maybe we don't feel like we fit in. But when I come to my own, I come to my home, it's, it's a refuge or my family, it should be a given that those, at least in my immediate family, love me, right? But Christ experienced the feeling of rejection even to the same people he came to save. Uh, he was literally born into this world to die for them, yet they rejected him. Uh, we find further it, in verse number five, kind of keeps going on here. Uh, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. Behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So we find that Joseph, uh, being loved by his father, provoked anger and in his brothers, loved more. Um, then we find that that love was demonstrated by a gift, and uh, that made him hate him even more. 
And then we find that God is speaking to Joseph through dreams, and this this is causing even more hatred in their hearts. We find a, a parallel example in the book of Matthew about even Jesus Christ, Matthew 12, verse number 6, "'Because I say unto you, that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, he would have condemned the guiltless.'" For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So we find Christ in his earthly ministry here, uh, walking along with his disciples, and they're eating and uh, on the Sabbath day. So uh, basically what Christ is telling them, he said, I'm the Lord even on days like today. Um, so he's basically ushering in a new covenant between Christ and uh, the one he has come to save. And we have these very um, critical um, hard-necked Pharisees that are just not seeing Christ the way he wants uh, them to see, very very much like Joseph and his brothers. If, if they knew what God had planned through Joseph, maybe they wouldn't have been so critical, but we find that their ignorance and their uh, blinded eyes cause just a hatred in their hearts toward Joseph. We find later on in the same chapter of Matthew 12, um, in verse number... Uh, 13 says, Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. So here he is, yet again, uh, breaking some of the laws they have there, and they enforce there on the Sabbath by healing a man. Um, in no way a, a bad thing, but in their minds, they're just not getting the picture of what Christ is actually there to fulfill. And verse 14 says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So very, very um, familiar passage of Scripture as far as what's happening even in the life of Joseph. Uh, just by proclaiming that he's Lord, they immediately hate him. Uh, just by telling them, hey, one of these days I'm going to uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up, they hated him. Just by doing the Lord's work and doing the right thing, being loved by his father, they hated him. Uh, so we find here that he was loved on one side, Joseph, but he was also loathed. He was hated by certain people. And let me tell you this, as a Christian, um, always know that you're loved by your Heavenly Father. But you will always be hated by some. Uh, maybe not your close friends, maybe not uh, even some of your enemies. But I will tell you this, that you are going to face adversity uh, through Satan, which in reality hates us. He he seeks to devour us, so that hatred consumes him, what he does in our lives. Uh, so we've got to learn to deal with that. And, and knowing that God's love is superior to any kind of hatred that we're going to receive in this life, and not let it necessarily uh, discourage us or uh, really hinder us in, in our walk with the Lord. So we find that he was loved but loathed. Number two, we find he was betrayed but later avenged. Uh, Genesis 37 and verse number 18 says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. So they're criticizing, poking fun. Um, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and he shall. we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. So thankfully, there's at least uh, a voice of reason there that uh, really tried to persuade them a different route than just killing Joseph. We find in verse 26, it says, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then they there passed by Midianites, uh, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph to Egypt. So we find here that they've devised a plan, not just to kill Joseph, but to sell him, seeking a profit for their betrayal. No doubt, uh, pretty common incidents that even happened in the life of Christ. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place... Under wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, 
saith the Lord. So Christ knows how jo uh, Joseph felt. Uh, Christ himself was sold by one of his own uh, in betrayal. Um, and notice Christ's reaction to this betrayal, uh, Christ's reaction to those meaning him harm. Uh, Luke 23 Verse number 33 says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So how would Christ expect us to handle vengeance if it was in our own hands? And many times we think it is, and we try to take it into our own hands. Uh, so many times when this adversity comes, when this... Uh, situation that's uh, not favorable, so to speak, uh, whether it's uh, inflicted by someone close to us or it's just something that happened, what, what's our first reaction? Um, obviously, many times it's not that of Christ um, because we find here in Romans twelve nineteen, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will play that saith the Lord. But later on, we find just in the next verse, there in Romans 12, verse number 20, it says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is Christ's solution for um, vengeance. Uh, many times, it's not for us to seek vengeance on our adversaries, on our enemies, uh, but it's it's just to love him. So hopefully we find later on that, that Joseph actually puts this into practice for us in, in this wonderful story here. So we find he was loved but loathed. We find he was betrayed but avenged. And, and number three, um, we find that he was cast down but not destroyed. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter number 39 of Genesis, we're going to continue on. Uh, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites and had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Uh, so we find here that uh, at any given point in our life, when we think that, man, I, I've really got it bad, uh, all these things are happening to me, all these hardships, these struggles, they could be financially, they could be um, in your marriage, in your home, at your job, uh, physical, emotional, whatever that may be, many times we see, uh, we seem to think that there's no end in sight. Uh, we can't necessarily see the rainbow on the other side of the storm, but we find uh, a very encouraging passage of scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So basically, uh, there, there's a passage, I, I, I can't tell you what exactly it is, but um, there's a principle given in the Bible when you see a branch that is broken at the point of falling. Basically, what Satan wants to do at this moment is to finish the job, right? He wants to tear it off. He wants to destroy it. Uh, whereas Christ will want to come and mend that branch. If he sees a candle that is at the point of going out and extinguishing, really what Satan wants to do is just finish that job, just blow it out, end it. But what Christ wants to do is to revive that fire. So many times we look around and think, Lord, what's, what's happening to me? Why is this happening in my life? Why am I facing this hardship? what is wrong, just keep in mind that God does have a plan for you. In Isaiah, it says he has thoughts of good, uh, not, not of evil, but of good towards us. He wants to see us prosper, and he wants to see us have victory in this. Uh, but many times, we're not going to experience that victory without a little bit of adversity in our life. Well, that doesn't make sense, maybe. But uh, think of some good biblical examples here. Um, I think by adversity, Noah was convinced even more of his task. Man, just by looking at the evilness of the world, the wickedness of the world around him, I think it drove him to finish that ark, uh, to complete his uh, assignment that God had given him. Uh, no doubt through adversity, Moses 
rescued the people of God. It's not that um, you know Pharaoh wanted to just hand him over on a silver platter. Uh, he was very much um, against it, and uh, God had to take them through some adversity and had to take them through some a lot of trials to fulfill His will. Um, later on, we find uh, through adversity, David uh, became the king of Israel. Uh, but let me tell you this. Um, without a giant, there may be no victory. Without adversity, there may be no rainbow on the other side. Uh, I mean, have you ever seen a movie, uh, a superhero movie, where there wasn't an enemy? No, because it would be boring, right? Uh, people want to see the origin, how it happened, and then they want to see the hardships and the adversity and the, the struggle and the strife, and then they want to see the victory. Uh, even when Things don't go the way a viewer wants to see it in a movie. They offer alternative endings where you can have the ending that you want to have, right? So, you know, in our minds, uh, we think, you know, this is happening in my life. Um, it's, it's a very hard situation to be in. But just know that God has plans to prosper you, just like he did in the life of Joseph. A uh, member of the Ted Woodrow actually talking about J.C. Penney. People often asked him about his success, and he said, Only by the help of adversity in Jesus Christ am I where I am today. So he even recognized that with adversity comes blessing if you trust in the Lord. So instead of trying to maybe avoid this adversity, this trial, this hardship, why don't you embrace it? Uh, for example, um, I, I don't own a whole lot of gold, but I do own this ring. You know, it's not the fanciest of of rings that's out there, but when they, uh, I guess, excavated this gold out of the dirt, uh, it really doesn't have a lot of value. Really what brings it that value is when you go through that process to purify that gold, and it, it's a lengthy process. It, it takes a lot of uh, time and effort to do this, and a lot of heat, just as we find in uh, 1 Peter 1 7 says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And later on, one of my favorite verses here in 1 Peter 5, verse number 10, says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So every adversity that you face, every trial that you experience, every hardship and every bad situation is there to complete one purpose, to glorify God. Um, many times after they go through the process of making the gold, making a, a you know, a piece of jewelry, a beautiful piece of art, many times, they don't hide it under a shelf. Uh, they display it. They put lights on it. And that's basically what God wants to do with us. Uh, I mean, think of Job. Uh, uh, he just, even centuries later, we're reading about Job and seeing him just put somewhat on a pedestal saying that was God that brought him through that. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. So don't shun away from adversity. Don't shun away from hardships and trials. Just know that during these trials that God is in control and he wants to use these trials to mold you and to make you into uh, this glorious vessel that he has in mind. So uh, hopefully that was an encouragement for you today. Uh, the title of the series, I forgot to mention, is actually um, From the Pit to the Palace, just talking about the um, transition that Joseph made from very horrible situation into a moment where he can be used of God and glorify God in, in his life. So hopefully that was a blessing to you. And just remember throughout the week that God has plans to prosper you. And he has big plans for you. And uh, don't give up now. God loves you. And you may feel like you're going through a trial through the fire. But just like any good potter, um, he's there watching, uh, ready to pull us out at the right moment uh, so we can glorify him uh, here even on this earth. So like I said, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. 
I pray, God, that you'd help it, Lord, uh, to penetrate our hearts and help us, Lord, to be not only a hearer of it, but also a doer of your word throughout this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks. God bless.